I'm very well, sir, thank you, and welcome all to my 70s. Today I'm joined by literally a superstar of the 70s, Malcolm Ian MacDonald. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, yeah, exciting times they were. We're going to get into how you were nicknamed, christened Super Mac, but first, let's just dwell on the superstar of the 70s because we did have a wonderful series the superstars and you literally were one of them wasn't you yes i have a feeling i might have been the first englishman Hmm. um to take part in superstars um and that first one it was in 19 oh about 1975 and it was in malmo in sweden um and and the first evening uh, having uh, having everybody check into the hotel, uh, we had a a long table um, set for dinner with all of us around it, and I found myself amongst the most incredible crowd of sportsmen. Um, and sitting to my right um, was um, Agostini, the great 500 cc motorbike world champion, who won the world championship 13 times. And to my left was the Spaniard, Angelo Nieto, who was the 250cc motorbike champion of the world. Um, And he had won the world title four times. So by heavens, I was in some titled company. What other competitors do you recall from uh, from that group? Because, there, as you say, it did go on for a few years, if memory serves me right, and some yeah. footballers did come in after. Kevin Keegan was another one that was very good. Yes. You stuck yeah, in. Yeah, Mick Shannon Kevin. took part as Mick, well. Mick did. The worst one that we had by far was Stan Bowles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I took part in one with Stan, yeah. Yes. Um, well... That first group, there was Joachim Mass, the yeah. Formula One racing driver. <clears throat> there was there was a guy called Willy Steveniers, who was Belgian, but he played basketball in America. Um, and he was acclaimed to be, um, at the time, just about one of the best in the world. Um, uh, there was... Now, there was, and there was a Dutchman called Harm Kuypers, and he was unique in as much that he had been, he had been a cycling champion, sprint champion. And, uh, um, and then he finished with cycling, and he turned to speed skating, and he became a world champion at that. And, and so cycling was a part of the, of, uh, it was one of the events in, in the superstars in the early days. Um, and, and we had to cycle. It was a sprint of 600 meters. So it was a lap and a half of the athletics track. And I was drawn against Harm Kuypers. And I said, hang on a minute. How come? Because the rules of superstars were that you couldn't take part in the event if it was your sport. Yep. And so I said, well, hang on, he was world champions, sprint cyclist. And they said, yes, but he, gave, he, he finished doing that and he's now a speed skater. If, if you were doing speed skating, he wouldn't be allowed to do it. So I, so I had to do 600 metres against an ex-world champion cyclist. And uh, after about 250 metres, he went flying past me. <laughs> literally flew past me. Uh, yeah, and he was a big lad as well. By heavens, he was. Took everything so seriously. Um, and he and I, in that competition, remained sort of neck and neck yes. until it came to the shooting near the end. Um, and I and I happened to, to have a bit of luck on that. And... Uh, um, scored nine out of ten. He got eight out of ten, and um, yeah, I was able to hit nine balls. Uh, was that from your left foot or right foot? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, it, 
I, I have to say, I staggered myself um, at that. But um, no, it, it was a, a it was a wonderful um, um, experience. Um, being in Sweden, of course, they had a Swede in the party, and I'm trying to. I, I think his name was Anders Andersson, but I wouldn't swear to it. Yeah, but it was, a- and he he was the Swedish. Um, he was the Swedish table tennis champion, and it came to the hundred meters uh, sprint, and and so we've all got our blocks in, ready for the start, and um, and we're all warmed up and stretched out, and so we've gone down on the blocks, and just before the gun went off, Anders Andersson just suddenly started flying up the track, and he was ten yards up by the time the gun went off. And so the, the gun was fired again um, for a full start. And we, um, we all lined up again on the blocks. And away we went. And this hand, um, Anders Andersen had full started yet again. And so a row started. The, the, the athletics people said, well, he's now disqualified. The television people said, no, no, no. He can't be disqualified because... The order in which we record it is not the order in which we show it. Yep. We change it all around, and therefore, we have to have everybody in their place. It's impossible in the middle of the program to say, oh, and uh, Anders Anderson was, uh, um, was eliminated due to disqualification. He said it just wouldn't make sense. And so, um, he was allowed to continue... Well, he false started nine times, and on the last one, he was 10, yard, 10 meters up the track. The gun went off, and I came flying out of the blocks, but expecting to hear uh, the gun go off again for a full start, and it didn't. And I thought, heavens above, they've let this one go. And so I really, really, absolutely flew to catch this guy up. And I just pipped him on the line. I just hit the tape a fraction ahead of him. And the wonderful athletics coach, Ron Pickering, was the commentator. (coughs) Wonderful, lovely man. Um, And he was sitting up in the stand having commentated on it. And he signaled to me, waving his arm, to to go up and see him. So up I went. (coughs) And he was all wired up for sound and what have you. Um, so he couldn't really move um, too far. And, um, and he said, come here, he said, sit down. He said, have you any idea what time you've just done? And I said, no, to be honest, I said, I haven't got a clue. He said, you've just run 10.4 for the 100 meters. He said, that makes you the second fastest man in the world right now. I went, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, it's true. He said, this year, there's only been... One man who has run the distance quicker than you in the world, and that was the Italian. I forget his name now. Yeah, I do, but it, was it Pietro Anastasi or something? I think it was. Yeah. That's right. He Thank was you. very, very fast. Oh, yeah, well well remembered. Um, and so uh, um, I, 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 I said, wow, I said, that's incredible. He said, the only problem is, he said, that we're going to have to run it again. <laughs> he said, because... It, it was so obvious that he should have been full started, uh, and it looks dreadful on the on the on the television. He said, "I've been looking on my monitor." He said, "And it just looks awful that when the smoke comes out of the barrel of the gun, the guy is ten meters up the track." He said, "So we've got to run it again." I'm afraid. He, um, he said, "So uh, um, he said, but let me tell you this." He said, as, a, as an athletics coach, he said, I specialize in sprinting, um, amongst other parts. He said, and I can take in excess of half a second off any sprinter's time through coaching and perfecting their stance and style. He said, so, he said, if you were in my hands, he said, I could make you the fastest man in the world. He said, I will get you down to about 9.8. And the world record at the time was 9.9. And I went, wow, are you serious? He said, yes, I am. He said, except it will never happen because you're a professional. And, and it was a sort of bit of snobbery came out from him. You know, that amateurs look down their nose at professionals. <laughs> so, uh, so that was that. But it, it was... It was a, 
it was a fascinating program to take part in. And I shall never forget, right at the end, um, we were all presented with a local piece of craft. And the, and, and the local craft was carved elephant. And then they were brightly painted like a, like a fairground merry-go-round. Um, and, and so the person in 10th place, who was Agostini, he was presented with, um, with a check and, um, and his elephant, which was about sort of two inches high. Yeah. Then the person who came ninth, his elephant was about four inches high. And so the elephants got bigger and bigger and bigger. And me having won, I got the biggest. And I had this elephant, which stood about 18 inches high. It was a, almost a foot wide. And it was so damned heavy, I, I could hardly lift it. And so the following day, I was walking through um, the airport at Malma. And I was walking through with Agostini, the Italian 500cc world champion. And, and he, he really was just a bag of laughs. Um, he, he kept coming out with, with really funny quips all of the time. And as we're walking through the airport, he said, you see, there can be advantages to not winning at times. And he sort of held up his little two-inch high elephant, <laughs> looked at mine, and, so, and there was me struggling underneath the weight of the damn thing. Um, and I, and, and he, he just took the mickey out of me all the way along the, uh, the walk to, the, um, to our flight. Uh, and uh, anyway, I did get the elephant home safe and sound without chipping the paintwork. But it was, a, it, it was a, an absolutely tremendous series. This was the first time I'd been involved in it. And I was invited to take part on three or four um, further occasions. And of course, the, the last one I did, that was um, down near Aldershot. And that was with Kevin Keegan um, and Mick Shannon. And that was when um, uh, Kevin Keegan came off his bike, if you remember. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. yeah took the skin off of the mm -hmm. side of his leg. Um, and, and also in that was Jeff Capes. Good at that as well. Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. Um, so uh, we were doing the weightlifting, and you could come into the competition whenever you wanted. Yeah? That you could sort of stay out whilst the, the smaller guys were lifting the lighter weight. And the way it worked was that it was the weight you lifted minus your body weight. Yeah. And so who would have the highest total? And I was in the lead and, and I had lifted, I, if memory serves me, it was 114 kilos. And, and my, my mass body weight at the time was somewhere around, um, was somewhere around 75 kilos. So I was quite happy with that. Um, it was a good plus and it had me in, well in the lead. Um, and then I failed. I failed at 115. And, um, and there was just one more person to lift and it was Jeff Capes. And he now stepped into the arena and he had a word with one of the officials and they just started stacking weights onto this bar. And he was a big lad, was Jeff Capes. Must have weighed somewhere in the region of about 19 stone. And I found out afterwards that they had instructed him, sorry, he had instructed them to put double his body weight on yeah. there. And he walked out, bent down, got one hand around the bar and lifted the thing straight up above his head, one-handed. He was... <laughs> Off. Yeah. It was the most phenomenal piece of strength I have ever witnessed in my life yeah. and he just made it look so easy as if he was lifting a feather a great uh, personality as well wasn't he Jeff and as was Brian Jacks because Brian Jacks was involved in the superstars as that's well that's right yes he was Brian Jacks um, uh, he was he was one of the most focused men that I've ever met in my life and he was just all the time focused on what he had to do, and, it, and, and you, couldn't, you couldn't get his attention away from that focus at all. You couldn't put him off. He just stayed focused. If he had something to lift, he would just stare at it, walk over, and lift it. Um, whatever he had to do, he just stayed this focused. I've never, ever, 
you know, and I've had, I've, I've sort of lived with sportsmen all around me, mm. but I've never seen anybody so focused as Brian Jack. Because the footballers, ordinarily, apart from you and Kevin, didn't particularly fare very well on the superstars, if memory serves me right. Some at James Hunt, the racing driver, he was another one while we're talking superstars. That's that right. really yeah. stands out for me as, as a kid. Well, James Hunt, I, I did a superstars with him, and he was um, such a, oh incredibly good-looking guy. Yeah, he was. And he just had two blondes with him all the while. <laughs> and, and his focus was was on them rather than the the different events that he was supposed to take part in um and everything was a um he just had this totally light-hearted attitude to everything um and it was almost a a sort of come what may i'm just going to laugh and of course you know when you think that uh, the the risks that that Formula One drivers were taking, particularly back in those days, where the cars were just getting faster and faster and faster, and there was less and less pr- protection for drivers. <coughs> um, and, and so it was a death-defying feat every time he, he drove a race. Um, and, uh, and yet he, he just had this devil take the hindmost, you know, this devil-may-care attitude. Um, and, he, he, and he was great company, great company to be in. Um, he really was. While we're still on the superstars um, years, let's just talk briefly about Stan. Was you involved at all with Stan in any of the episodes of Superstars? Yes. <laughs> in yeah, the in the um, drink when you both went over. Oh, yes, Stan <laughs> caused me my most embarrassing moment ever on television. Um, that it, it, it was the con- we were canoeing mm. outdoors. Um, on a lake, and he and I were to canoe together, and he was so nervous and unsure, and he got into this canoe, and, and you have to remain absolutely still in terms of not rocking it, you know, that you, you, you just um, move in your upper body, um, but you have to move in a way that keeps everything absolutely straight. You can't go side to side or anything like that. Well, the gun went off, and Stan and I, um, we took off. And Stan was, he was just having such a fight trying to keep this canoe balanced. And it was hysterical. It really was hysterical to watch him. And he, he suddenly flipped and went underwater. And I was laughing so much that I flipped over as well. I just couldn't keep my balance at all laughing at Stan um, and so that <laughs> oh and also um, yes there's another memory of Stan in that competition um, it, it was we, we were all rather surprised at how nervous of things he was nervous yeah. of getting mm-hmm. in a canoe nervous of water um, and then we had the shooting and they used to do all sorts of use all sorts of weapons this particular time they were they were just using a pistol and the rules were that you have the barrel of the pistol as you hold it um, on the table, pointing downwards, and the barrel is on the table. The, the point of the barrel is on the table, and from there you then lift, aim, fire, and put the gun back down um, to touching uh, the table. And so, Stan, you could see that he was dreadfully nervous of holding a gun. You know, he'd never have been able to uh, rob a bank, I can assure you. Um, uh, and so they said, aim, ready, aim, fire. That was the shout that, uh, that we would get. And so Stan, he's lifted the, the gun for the first time. He's fired, he's put it down onto the table and then shot the table. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was well and truly dead, I can assure you. He was a genius on the football pitch, but off it, he was a bloody disaster. What was he saying? He was, yeah, yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, I, and, and an old colleague of mine, he, we were at Fulham together and then we were at Luton together, Don Shanks. Yeah, Shanks, a legend. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Shanks became his big mate. Yeah. 
when they were at QPR together. And, and Shanksy, I think, just uh, um, kept Stan going. He sort of kept him um, in reasonable shape um, and pointed him in the right direction. I'm not sure that that's strictly true, Malcolm, because them boys were two peas of the same pod. And as Stan, as Stan wrote in his autobiography, we were like two cartoon characters that went through life and left a trail of destruction behind um, something them. Something like that, <laughs> yes. But without Don Shanks there, yeah. the destruction would have been ten times worse. Oh, I think you're probably right there, Malcolm. And didn't, they, didn't those boys like a gamble? Oh, didn't they just? Yes. And I think that was the only reason that Stan got involved in Superstars. I think Don was sorting out a few bob for them both, and then they realised that Stan was bloody useless at everything. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, what... pretty much so. I remember one time when um, Stan was playing for Nottingham Forest. Yeah. Brian Clough was the manager, and I was at Arsenal. And, and we played Forest in, in, in the uh, Saturday afternoon. And I had, um, I owned a, a, um, a quarter of a, of a greyhound. Right. Um, uh, and, and the other three owners and myself, we, um, if the dog was racing, we would do our best to get there. And he usually raced in open racing um, on, a, on a Saturday. And so he could go all over the place. You know, he could be at oh, any one of a, a, a number of tracks um, down south. And, um, and, and it, was, it was a good bit of fun. I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not much of a gambler at all. Um, I, 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 but I, I really love the sport of it all. Yep. Um, and the camaraderie. Yep. And, so, and, and, and this was being held at White City that particular night, uh, the meeting. And our dog was running in the outside, um, the outside race, which is um, uh, um, dogs from elsewhere yeah. uh, who are registered elsewhere. They're allowed to come in and, and race. And so, of course, the the bus that I was on um, with the Arsenal team that travelled down and dropped us all at Southgate in North London, um, where we got our cars parked. And I then drove around the North Circular and got myself to uh, White City. And I met up with the three other owners of this dog. And, and, the, and they were talking with the trainer. And I arrived just in time for the trainer, to hear the trainer telling the owners. Um, and Salerno, was, he was a hurdler. Yeah, the dog was called Salerno. He was a hurdler. And he was sort of getting on in years. But he had an absolutely great spirit about it. And the trainer said he's been absolutely brilliant all this week. Oh, he's on absolute top form. And I would thoroughly recommend that you, that you back him and back him heavily. And so we've all gone away and gone, right, wow, um, okay. So we checked the list and, and our dog was sort of three to one. And we wondered whether we could maybe get seven to two. Um, and this was really just going to be my one bet of the evening um, because, you know, I, it, I've got the personal interest in it. Yeah. And, and so I've just had a fairly large bet and I'm walking back to our position and there was Stan at the bar. And, and so uh, I, I said, hey, Stan, I said, didn't realize you were coming along here tonight when I, when I saw you. Um, and leaving Nottingham Forest ground. He said, yeah, yeah. He said, I came straight here. And I, and I remembered that he'd got into a taxi up in Nottingham. So, and he had taken a, he had taken a taxi all the way from Nottingham to uh, White City. Um, and, uh, and I looked down and there was a, a rather sizable mound of torn up betting slips. And I thought, well, he's not having a very good night so far. So I said, Stan, I said, I've... I, I own a dog. I own a leg of a dog that's in the next race, the open race. I said, and we've just been talking with the trainer. Now, between you and I, the trainer says he is absolutely on fire. Um, his name's Salerno. We've just had a bet. We got seven to two on him. I said, at worst, you'll get three to one. I said, highly recommend it. And he opened his little racing book and looked at the, the form of all the dogs. And he went, it hasn't got a chance. I went, oh, well. Um, up to you, Stan, but 
the trainer says he's, he's got every chance. And I walked away and we went outside and we watched the race and our dog flew it. Absolutely flew it. And, and I went back inside to the bar where Stan was and his pile of ripped up tickets had grown quite sizably. <laughs> I thought, oh dear, uh, he should have taken a little bit of advice. But, that but was, I don't think he was good at doing that, not no, from anybody. No, that was Stan. He was a one-off. He was a genial figure. And God bless him, he's given us an awful lot of stories. And a reminder, we have a further two episodes with Malcolm McDonald in our series, My 70s.